Hello there. Welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Today, today is a very special day for me because I can finally talk about something that I have been very excited about for a very long time. And I haven't been allowed to talk about it because of non-disclosure agreements. And now it's time to disclose. It's time to disclose my thoughts and opinions. So that's what we're here to do. We're going to talk about the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. The Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica is the new... It's the new Dungeons & Dragons supplement, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons supplement. It is, uh, it is the campaign setting for the world of Ravnica. So Ravnica is the current uh, and past uh, setting for uh, Magic the Gathering. And this represents a, a, big, a big kind of like combination of things that honestly, as a, a person who has been into Magic on and off for a very long time, and Dungeons and Dragons for a very long time. This represents the the finality of uh, what I perceive to have been a deal that took place many many years ago. Right back when I was around, I was I was aware of of kind of the the situation uh, as a D and D fan back when uh, Wizards of the Coast first bought TSR when they saved TSR from from fiscal destruction uh, and started publishing Dungeons and Dragons books. And when that happened, pretty much the entire internet, basically the whole internet was like, yo, so when are we going to get a Dominaria setting? Obviously, that's the next thing that'll happen. Obviously, that will be the next thing to occur. However, it just didn't. They just never, they kept the, they kept their two, their two houses apart. And, and, you know, for some people that was great. Some people were like, yeah, I don't want magic. I don't want peanut butter in my chocolate. Um, but other people were like, but where... What about, where is, okay. Um, and now, and I know this isn't the first time, right? There was, um, there was a supplement uh, that, that had a little bit of magic stuff. And I think that was, that was Wizards testing the water. But this is, this is the real deal. This is the full-on affair. Yeah, plane shift stuff, right? So this is the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Uh, it is available uh, on Roll20 right now. Um, there are other places that you can get it. Wizards has their their sort of staggered release of books uh, these days, so uh, it is possible you could pop into your own uh, your own friendly local game store and grab a copy. Uh, I'm going to show you this version because it's a version on the internet that I can show you. Um, so it'll it'll be structured a bit differently. Uh, obviously, we won't be going through it necessarily like front to back, but uh, we'll we'll show you the the Roll Twenty version of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and we can talk a little bit about kind of the stuff that I think is cool in of itself uh and then also the stuff that is cool um as like a bit your ability to excise content and put it ex uh, elsewhere because there are things in this like loxodon for example that i'm going to be using in um i'm going to be using in um court of swords so we'll talk we'll talk a little bit about uh about that so so yeah let's do it uh, so this is the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. It's a it's a setting book in the sense that it describes the place of Ravnica, um, but like there's a lot of mechanical stuff in here that I like too, which is really cool. Um, I I'm I'm again I'm from the era of Dungeons and Dragons where a campaign setting was a box set with like. A, a half dozen small books in it and they would they would give you maps and they would describe all this stuff and like that's cool but they're doing campaign settings in a different way and and I think and correct me if I'm wrong outside of like Sword Coast this is kind of the first like setting book for for 5th edition it's the first time that that D&D has has kind of given us a like here are paragraphs of lore about about the universe and it's sort of good timing for me because i just got back into magic and i don't know shit all about ravnica i don't know anything about ravnica um i i learned looking at the cards people explained things to me and now i have looked through the book and i'm like oh i get it because for me contextualizing a setting as a role-playing game is a really good way to get kind of in touch with it so now i'm really excited i really really want to play a game set in in Ravnica um, because of this book. So let's let's take a look. So so obviously there's a bunch of stuff in Roll Twenty that we'll we'll look at, right? Like the Roll Twenty version of it does the usual stuff where it gives you uh, it gives you all the maps as independent tabs, which is cool. So I can take players over there. 
Um, you know, we get our token page with all the all the built in tokens, all of that stuff. Um, but we also want to look. I want to look through the kind of the book content. Um, so the the way the way I'm going to do that is I've got I've got my little table of contents pulled up here, and we'll just open new. We'll open the new tabs and we'll we'll flip through it that way, and then we'll look at all of the the cool stuff. So the game the game book Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica is broken down into uh, six chapters with a, a prelude uh, explaining Ravnica in general. Uh, we've got character creation, so this is where we're going to get all of our new uh, races and classes and subclasses and all that kind of content. There is some setting material in Guilds and 10th District. Right? Guilds of Ravnica and the 10th District explain the the core society of Ravnica and then what does Ravnica actually look like. And this is cool because there are maps. We can actually look at what a subset of Ravnica, the 10th District, looks like. And we'll talk about the world of Ravnica when we, when we get there. Uh, there's a GM section. Uh, for how to make Ravnica specific adventures, right? How do we make it feel like this setting? Um, there are uh, magic items, new magic items. There are friends and foes. So if you want the stats for Niv Mazette, wait for chapter six. We can see how many hit points it would take to kill this guy. I mean, I know he's only a five, five flying, but let's find out how many hit points he has in D&D &D because that's the most important thing about a monster, how to kill it. Uh, and then there's our credits and, and attributes at the end. So... This is the thing, and and this is the thing that I really like about, and I've I've I was resistant at first. I'll tell you, I was resistant when we started doing Tomb because Tomb of Annihilation was my first like, here is a D and D adventure. You are used to these being books and maps. Here they are in in uh, roll twenty form, and I was resistant. I was like, what? It's all over the place. How do I read this front to back? Like, what? This is confusing, and I don't like it. But a few episodes in, I was like, oh. It's like I cut every page out of the book and I can have all the pages I need open at once and I can I can shrink them and I can so it's like a book but it's super modular. So this way I've got all of the different chapters I need and I can I can open them either in their own uh, in their own window or I can open them as separate windows and I'm so I'm hooked now. Like now, now I like going back and reading a book like, I, I looked at this when I first got access to Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. I was flipping through it like a book, and I was like, uh, this is fine to read, but when I GM this, I want to have, yeah, I want to have all of these pages ripped out and spread across my my virtual desk. So uh, so that's going to be that's gonna be really useful in running it. Um, my hope is that we do a show for Ravnica, a Ravnica set show uh, at some point down the line, and you'll get to see me put some of this stuff into, into action. So anyway... Uh, let's let's start with the we'll start with the the table of contents. I'm not going to read every single word of this book to you, but we can flip through it, and then later uh, you can you can let me know if there's anything specific that you want to duck into that I, I haven't done. So, the Guildmaster's Guide starts by explaining kind of what the book is. Right, this book is your point of entry into Ravnica as a setting for your D and D campaign. It guides you through the process of creating characters and adventures set here. So it's a book that's aimed at both dungeon masters and at players. Um, there, uh, there's an explanation of Ravnica, a vast sprawling city that covers the whole of the known world. Ravnica teems with intrigue and adventure driven by the conflicts among the 10 powerful guilds that rule the city. This is the answer to, this is the answer to Jared's first question, right? What is this about? This is about a vast sprawling city teeming with intrigue and adventure driven by conflicts between 10 powerful guilds. Now we know. If you want to make your Ravnica about something different, you're going to be struggling against intrigue and adventure driven by conflicts, 10 powerful guilds, right? That's what this book is about. And that's that's pretty succinct. It's a nice way to lay it out. So now we know what to expect. Uh, it gives us a little history about Ravnica, which I didn't know. Ravnica has been around since 2005. It's had eight different card sets dedicated to it. Right, City of Guilds, Guild Pack, Dissension, Return to Ravnica, Gate Crash, Dragon's Maze, Guilds of Ravnica, and the upcoming Ravnica Allegiance. One of the most popular settings because the 10 guilds support the way players build magic decks. Now, before we get into talking about the guilds and stuff, um, so you understand the core the core material. If you're not a if you're not a like a a, a magic fan, uh, let me let me draw you a crappy diagram. So there's like. There's like five kinds of magic, and I'm not going to color code them for you, but imagine these are different colors. There's five kinds of magic, five different types of magic in the world, and each type of magic is based on different uh, stuff. Black magic is like zombies and vampires, and white magic is like healing and hawks. Uh, blue magic is about telling people they're not allowed to do things. They all have their own flavor, and the guilds, 
the guilds in uh, the guilds in Ravnica are built on a combination of two colors. So like Rakdos, the guild of uh, demon worshiping uh, uh, maniacs, they are a combination of two colors, right? Red and uh, red and, and black. Uh, the Slesnia, um, uh, the Slesnian Conclave, they are uh, they are two colors. They're green and white, right? And so the guilds are all these lines. Those are the guilds. So that's why it's such a popular setting in uh, in Magic because the fiction, go fucking figure. The fiction is represented by the mechanisms. Turns out, even in a card game like Magic the Gathering, uh, it turns out that that's super important. So that's the so that's the deal. Um, the idea is that uh, it resonates well because the, there's no there's ludo narrative uh, cohesion. The mechanisms of the game and the uh, and the setting fit together. Now I'm curious to find out how they manage to make that apply to D, D. what kinds of stories can we tell because in this you're not planeswalkers right you're not you're not uh tapping lands you're not summoning land war elves you are the land war elf right you're the wojek bodyguard you're you're the loxodon in this you're not the planeswalker right so it'll be interesting to set it up and to see if you can play a game that's 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 fun being the land war elf right so let's let's take a look at uh, at what is made up of what, what we've got in these chapters. So we'll we'll start in with chapter one and we'll just go through each go through each chapter. So character creation, um, and as usual, surprising no one, uh, because they're leveraging all the magic art. Look how beautiful this stuff is, so good. So uh, character creation, following the following the um, the paths of the um, the regular D and D books, we start with character creation because it's like you need a character to to participate in the game. So here are some options: you could be this simic hybrid, you could be this badass Boros, uh, maybe a paladin or a fighter, you could be a, a Silesian Loxodon druid. It's giving you options. You could be these these skulking Dimir nerds up here, right? This is this is the idea of showing you like here are some things you might be able to be in this in this city, um, and so it's going to walk us through character creation. Now, what's cool is when you create a character for a Ravnica campaign, you go through the same steps as the player handbook, but you're going to choose a guild. You're going to choose a guild when you make your when you make your character. So now this is this is cool, and I think I think there should be. Let's see if there's a if we can see a separate page for that art there's a questionnaire and i've never seen i've never seen this before in a in a DD book let's take a look uh let's see if i can look it up i wonder i wonder what it will fall under in the in the um let's see uh what should i look for here uh let's see uh chapter two i'm just gonna look for ravnica and we'll see what we can find it's a piece of it's a piece of art like a specific piece of art that i'm looking for um but it's yeah it's like a choose your own adventure type of a deal uh oh in the roll 20 version oh okay cool um do you know uh alex do you know where it is in the like if, what i should search for if i wanted to find that specific thing rather than like dig through dig through the list because what it is basically in the in the the book that i saw it's like a big diagram that shows you um it shows you like a flow chart we're looking for i'm looking for the the like how to pick a guild um diagram uh which i i only know exists in the in the book but um it's the uh what's important to me yeah that thing uh, but i'm just not sure how to find it in the uh in the the roll 20 uh, version of it it's a handout oh okay Oh, of course it is. Thank you. Okay, so these are all these are all the the handouts, right? Supplemental materials uh, for for this thing. So let's let's see if I can find it in here. Ravnica characters choosing a guild. Uh, okay, so this is this is the same thing we were just looking at, uh, and then what's important to me? There it is. Okay, cool. So. If you want to figure out what guild you want to belong to, and I I this I would love D and D to have this. I would love like flat D and D just to have this thing. So in the player's handbook, what's important to me? Casting spells, fighting monsters with a sword, like this. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for your help, uh, Mads and uh, and Alex. Um, 
So this is how, if you don't know anything about the guilds, uh, you can do this. And then, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're using a screen reader, there's a Q&A uh, survey version of it. So, for example, okay, what's important to me? Nature and science, learning other people's secrets and keeping my own, society and community. I think of these three things, let's say uh, nature and science. Okay, where would we rather spend our time? In the laboratory or in nature, growing things? Mm, I'm interested in the lab. What are we doing? Doing what in the lab? Tinkering with technological devices or modifying life forms to suit my vision? Mm, tinkering with technology. Oh, I guess I belong to the Is It League. There you go. So this is a cool way. If you don't know anything about the universe, this is a really nice way to like guide people uh, into being able to choose uh, their their character class. Um, it's because guilds are an important, and you'll see how they're important mechanically in a minute. I love that if you want to be part of House Demir, Dimmer, Demir. I always say Demir because Dimmer is a switch you use to turn a light bulb down. But in this, learning other people's secrets and keeping my own, that's Demir. Everything else is someone else. <laughs> right? Like, if you're not interested in learning other people's secrets, get out of here. This is what we do. This is what we do here in this house. Um, so this is cool. This is a great thing to hand your players. This will be the very first thing that I show my players if we do a Ravnica game. I'll be like, boom, start here. And then you can ask me questions and we can we can kind of figure out more about like what those specific things uh, mean. All right. So uh, so that going along with that, and, and this is again, this is that roll 20 thing where I can have this open and refer to it while I'm doing other stuff. Here, let me shrink it down here. So I can just have this questionnaire open while I also have this other page where I'm looking at the text, which is pretty dope. So chapter two will describe all the 10 guilds in detail. How do you decide the guild? You can do this questionnaire. Um, and then what you're gonna do is read, read the guild descriptions, choose one of those, read the description of races and classes. Guild membership recommendations are provided for each one. And if you have access, this is cool, if you have access to magic cards from the set, find a card that appeals to you and build that character. We talked about this, and we have been talking about this on every single Magic stream so far, right? Where every time we do the Magic streams, I'm like, that's a D&D &D character, that's a D&D &D character, that's a D&D &D character. So there's an option too. Here, I have some. I have some right here. So I can be like, um, let's see. I would like to be, uh, I'd like to be this, this badass. I would like to be the child of night, right? She's like, pale she's got blood on her face and she's like skulking in the shadows okay cool how can i make her in the in the game right um so that's that's cool so this way you can say i base my character on the art for the boros challenger or for uh the goblin in risk factor uh and that's that's a cool way to kind of bring you into uh bring you into the into the game uh and then same thing if you're a magic player you already have a favorite guild create a character from that guild right do you like your uh mono blue deck Cool, maybe Simic. Do you like your uh do you like your your red blue counterspell deck you're playing? Play an is it character. Now there's an option you can play a character who isn't uh a member of a guild. Um you can be any race, class, or alignment if you want. Um, but there's a, a whole section about talking about um how to be a how to how to be a non guild member. Um I'm personally not super interested in that because it's the 10 guilds. That's that you ties you to the thing. It's so fun. Um, so each guild provides races uh, and classes that are options in the game. Um, if you choose a, a race or class not typical for the guild, you're going to have to work to like fit, uh, which is cool. And, and again, this is like you can choose what you want. Um, you can choose what you want uh, and then fit it yourself. Or you can make something that fits and not have to worry too much about it. Um, new stuff in the game. So... Races you can choose from. This is brand new stuff for Ravnica. You can now play a Centaur, a Ravnican Goblin, a Loxodon, a Minotaur, a Simic Hybrid, and a Vidalcan. So some familiar things, Goblins, Minotaur, Centaur, uh, Vidalcan, Simic Hybrids, Loxodon. So those are, those are new. Those are new Ravnica type things. So Centaurs, Goblin, Loxodon, Minotaur, Simic Hybrid, and Vidalcan. Those are all new. Um, it also presents new two new subclasses, uh, the order domain for clerics, so you can play like a Boros order cleric, uh, or a circle of spores druid if you want to be a Golgari. So new class options and uh, and new um, 
and new options. And then, of course, they talk about how, uh, and later we'll look at this, they talk about how um, every race and class that exists in the game fits or doesn't fit into Ravnica. Um, this is kind of neat. And and I again, D, there's stuff in this Ravnica game that I wish that D&D had more generally. So, like, you can put together a group of characters that are all in different guilds if you want, right? You can be like, I'm a Gruul, I'm a Selesnia, I'm a Simic, and then try to find ways to fit them together, right? So they could be united by an alliance, they could be common principles, um, they could be childhood friends, or just thrown together by a bad situation. There's, there's a table for this. Um, or there's also suggestions for everybody playing the same uh, the same group, like they're all part of the same guild. So each guild will have its own. If you want to play a game focused on, we are all members of the Golgari Swarm, what classes should we play? So check this out. This is really cool. Party makeup. You can say if you want to play a classic D&D party, play a Boros or Selesnya Cleric of the Life Domain, an Azorius or Boros Fighter with the Champion Archetype, a Dimmer or Golgari Rogue, or a Boros, uh, and a Boros or Is It Wizard. A Law and Order party, a mad science party, a skulkers party, a chaos party, a nature party, or a benevolent party. Isn't that cool? So I thought that was quite neat. So you, my, obviously I, I am inclined, unless the players are all already like, we definitely all just want to be Boros. I will probably do the like, you're all complicated and I need to fit you together. But this is such a great way to say like, as a group, you can sit down and try to pick one of these. Or you have a common cause. You are cellmates in an Azorius prison, a gruel camp, or a Rakdos cage. You are fighting a greater threat. There is a sudden danger. You are a dream team, right? A dream led you to the same destination. You've gotten lost together. You are part of a detente, right? You have a secret mission where you, like, have to work together, even though you might hate each other. Um, or you have a common foe, or you're trying to avert a catastrophe, right? Pretty cool. I think I'm going to go with common foe. This campaign, your common foe is Jace Bellerin. Jace, Jace Bellerin, your quest, kill Jace Bellerin. You'll get bonus XP if you can kill Teferi too, but he's in another universe, so lure him here, then kill him. Um, so yeah, this is this is kind of the the setup, and I love this. This is like setting this is this is setting expectations, right? This is something that there's a lot in Ravnica that I wish basic D and D should should have. I wish that D and D's player hand, player's handbook had this stuff, because this is this is session zero, isn't it? What kind of characters are we making? What kind of game do we want our game to be? Are we interested in a law and order party? Do we want mad science? What are we interested in as players? Let's build our party around that. Let's build our characters to fit the party, right? This is how you should be starting your D&D game to begin with. So once you've done that, uh, this is where you can pick your, your characters. We do our what's, Im what's important to me, uh, which we looked at. And now we talk about Ravnican races. So this is going to talk about how uh, characters fit into, into Ravnica. So aside from humans, elves, and a smattering of half-elves, the races from the player's handbook are unknown on Ravnica, unless they're visiting from other worlds. So if you're playing a Ravnica game, and I, I love this, you can't be a tiefling, can't be an Azamar, you can't be a gnome, you can't be a, a dwarf. Uh, these things just don't exist in Ravnica unless you've, like, wandered there from somewhere else. And I love that. I love when games are willing to just put their foot down and be like, I'm sorry, we're limiting your options. However, here's some other good shit you can be instead. So humans on, on Ravnica are pretty much the same uh, as everything else. Uh, elves in their three common sub-races exist. Centaurs, the quintessential merging of human and horse, Savor freedom and champion nature's cause. Goblins are small, fierce, stealthy, and sometimes comical. Loxodons resemble humanoid elephants with powerful bodies, stoic natures, and serene wisdom. Minotaurs are sophisticated tacticians as well as strong and fierce warriors. Simic hybrids, which is that elf with the crab claw we saw. Uh, the result of the Simic Combine's guardian project, magically infusing the adaptive quality of a certain animal species onto human elf or Vidalcan volunteers. Vidalcan are tall, blue-skinned, and ingenious with an insatiable curiosity and a penchant for invention. Yeah, we'll look, we'll look at the goblin stats and see if they're the same as the ones from, from Valos. So these are the ones that, uh, that are, uh, that are uh, in the game that you are allowed to play. Uh, everything else, you would have to work with your GM to like jam them in. 
I would I would like to so the things that I love there are some things that I love in in Ravnica that you can't play as a PC but I would love to make a playable version of um Gorgons right like like Vraska Gorgons would be cool and I, I think you could do it I think you could do a toned down uh, petrification thing that's just like hold person once every long rest or something like once you're level three um also vampires because vampires in i think vampires in ravnica are actually a lot easier to to do because they're not they just drink blood uh they're not they're not like afraid of sunlight that kind of thing um and then um angels but angels are like demigods so i don't think a pc angel is appropriate but for now and i'm sure like if people buy into ravnica a lot and they 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 like it um i think that people would um yeah, people would like they would likely build on some stuff. Maybe there's room for a GM's guild. Maybe I'll do like a, a quasi Gorgon kind of thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, magic. Um, magic. Uh, vampires are yeah, like Ixalan vampires. They're the same in Ravnica. There's also another kind of vampire. We'll look in the bestiary that drains um, uh, mental energy. Yeah, a demi gorgon. Exactly. My thought precisely. <laughs> All right. So these are our options. We can make a human, an elf, a centaur, a goblin, a loxodon, a minotaur, a simic hybrid, or a vidalcon. Uh, there's all the details on the new race. Centaurs are 600 pounds multiplied by 2d12 pounds. Um, uh, there's, yeah, there's all these. I mean, not the total. It's, yeah, x 2d12. Yeah. Um, starting with the base. Uh, so there's all that detail there. Nothing new or exciting. Um, I like this. I think this is cool. They talk about the species. Like they tell us how elves are different and how they, how they fit into the, uh, into the, the world of Ravnica. So like humans, uh, are a scant majority, uh, dominating some guilds, barely represented in others. Uh, they are innovators, achievers, and pioneers. They're pretty normal for, like, player's handbook, uh, guys. Not one of the Peruns, these are the founders of the Ten Guilds, was human. Although the Ghost Council of the Orzov Syndicate is of human origin. Uh, likewise, no current guildmaster is human. But humans are lieutenants, advisors, and strategists. Their ambition and drive propel them to the top, but, like, they can't contend with dragons, sphinxes, and demons. I like that. I like that it's, like... There's lots of humans, but like nobody, they're not special in the way that sometimes some games make them special. Um, the common tongue is a human language. Uh, humans sometimes borrow names from other races, but they have a rich pool to draw on. You could be a human named Lucian, Nikos, Venik, Trigori, Tibor, Sirislav. And I think Ravnica, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like a Slavic lean to humans, right? Nodov, Valenko, Vinloskarga. Winslav, Kapobar, Koba, like these are these are very like Slavic induced. And this is why I think that it's important to look at name lists because they can indicate to you uh the 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 kind of the kind of culture you might be looking at, right? So that's interesting. Human culture is yeah, like a little a little bit like Slavic influence, like Eastern uh, European kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's look at elves. Uh, so elves of Ravnica, um, they, uh, they're broken. They all are associated with nature, no matter, uh, no matter what. Um, and they are, uh, they're drawn to appropriately to those guilds, right? Selesnia, Golgari, and Simic. Um, the Gruul clans revere nature, but they oppose civilization. So most elves, cause they, they fit into, into civilization. So elves in this, there are three sub races, high elves, wood elves, and dark elves and dark elves aren't drow and that makes me so happy because now i can have them in my game because they're so boring and weird so they're shadow elves the devkarin elves closely connected with the golgari swarm they live underground they share the dark elf sensitivity to sunlight but they're not for some reason pitch black so yeah devkarin are okay drow not as interesting to me so you could be a, a devkarin elf a silhana elf uh, or the High Elves of Ravnica who have been subsumed into the Simic Combine and lost their uh, lost their, their tribal name. Um, so that's cool. They give you some names for those. But you can pretty much just play like a Dark Elf, a Wood Elf, or, uh, or a High Elf. Um, so let me see. What's the next? What's the next thing? Where's my... There it is. All right. Let's get into it. Let's look at 
So there's a centaur. Damn, girl. <laughs> so there's a centaur. There's a centaur for us. Uh, Ravnican centaur. Um, super heavy metal centaur. Uh, they are nature's cavalry. There's some some detail about what they belong to, uh, the various guilds. Um, they, 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 they call out this, this interesting, uh, I think, yeah, here it is. In Ravnica, where open roads seems like a contradiction and open plain is sheer nonsense, centaurs retain a love of wide spaces and the freedom to travel. As much as they can, they run in wild places, spacious parks, and expanses of rubble and ruin. Uh, when we look at the maps, you'll see just how big Ravnica is. Um... So let's take a look at their stats, right? This, this explains kind of how they, how they work. It gives us some ideas about the way they look. Um, so if you're playing a centaur in Ravnica, uh, you get a plus two strength, plus one wisdom. Um, they mature the same as humans. They tend toward neutrality. Uh, Selesnian, uh centaurs. Selesnian centaurs are neutral good. Uh, Gruul centaurs are usually chaotic neutral. They're between six and seven feet tall. Uh, with their equine bodies reaching about four feet at the withers, so they're medium, medium size. Um, they have a base speed of forty feet, so that's cool. So, like, uh, damn. Um, when you're a monk, do you get a bonus to your speed, or does your speed become forty? Because that would mean their speed. A monk, a centaur monk, would have a speed of fifty feet. It's a bonus. Damn. They're so fast. Yeah, barbarians too. That's right. Yeah. Monk and barbarians. Hyperspeed centaur. Yeah, karate hoof. Um, so they're not humanoids. They're fey. So that's interesting because uh, spells that affect humanoids. Uh, you are you are in me. Let me look. Does charm, does charm person affect humanoids? Oh, it does. Oh, cool. Interesting. So I guess also hold person too. Damn. That's cool. That's actually really useful. Uh, so you'd have to use charm monster to charm them. Cool. Okay. Uh, you have a charge move. So if you move at least 30, 30 feet towards a target and hit it with a melee attack, you get a bonus attack with your hooves. Your hooves are natural melee weapons. They can make unarmed strike. Uh, if you hit with them, you deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier instead of the normal bludgeoning damage for unarmed strike. Cool. All right. Um... And then you're one size larger, like a fur bulk, right? One size larger for push, drag, that kind of thing. Um, however, in addition, a climb that requires hands and feet is especially difficult because of your equine legs. When you make a climb, each foot of movement costs you four extra feet. Oh, Jesus. So a, a, a la climbing a ladder as a centaur, if it's a 10-foot ladder, it's a 50-foot ladder. <laughs> I never seen a horse climb a ladder before. Uh, and then you get uh, common and sylvan. Sylvan is, common, is spoken in the Silesian Conclave. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess oh yeah, it'd be forty feet, right? Um, I guess the thing the thing here that is most interesting to me is their higher walking speed, their higher base speed, and the fact that they're fey. Like charge and hooves are fine, and whatever, but like that's. That's pretty cool, especially at low levels. That protects you from some some like low level magic that would normally really fuck up your day. Cool. That's centaur. Um, oh my god, a centaur with spider climb. <laughs> okay, so let's look at goblins. I wonder. Let me pull up. I'm gonna do a compare and contrast. Let me pull up the goblins from Volos too. Um, goblins. Oh, am I looking at the same? I think this might be the same. Yeah, I pulled up the wrong one. Um, where's the Volos? Goblinoids. Here we go. Monstrous Adventures Goblins. Okay, so we'll let that, that pop up. Um, so there's our goblin. I like I like goblins. Maybe I clicked the wrong thing. I like goblins in um I like goblins in in Magic the Gathering because they are uh, they're not just one kind of goblin. Like you you will see the the kind of like um world of warcraft goblin that's like 
time is money, friend. Like that's that's a thing in in uh in Ravnica and in Magic. But you also see these like enormous burly like ripped goblins, right? Like there's a ton of there's a ton of art of goblins in um uh in this uh in this setting where they're just like beefy as hell. Uh which I think is super cool. You can play like a goblin fighter and uh and it's it's still like yeah chain willers goblin locksmith yeah beefy and small so uh they uh they're small and wiry so they're gonna be they're gonna be small creatures mostly are they're bald by heredity or choice but a few boast shocks of red or black hair um many go unshod to leave their toes exposed for climbing um you mostly find them in is it gruel Rakdos or occasionally Boros. I love Boros goblins. Like I love them so much. The little goblin like war boss, they're wearing like the plate armor. If you played a goblin, a Boros goblin paladin, I I would I am I love it. They're so cute and funny. Um so uh so that's your that's your little tiny justice goblin. Yep. Their names are usually now look, so we were talking about this before. Uh some some uh some races in in um, in the world culturally tend to divide their their names their naming conventions by gender. Goblins do not. Uh, goblins have just a single list to pull from, uh, and they don't have uh, a, a gender binary uh, in their names. I wonder. I mean, I, I assume because of normativity being what it is, uh, I assume that goblins are treated as like he and she in magic lore. But I feel like if I were if I were running this, I would just say all goblins are non-binary because their culture doesn't. Like other people might assign a, a gender to them, but like Mizix, Wexeny, Lysaxa, Estrix, Sunix. You basically have to have a Z and at least one X, maybe two or three. Um, so yeah, goblin language is fond of certain sounds, Z and. <laughs> cracking and zapping noises. Um, okay, so let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at their abilities. So plus two dex, plus one con. And I wonder. Let me let me see. Maybe I can get at. Maybe I can get at the. The Volos. Um, maybe I can get at the Volos goblins through. Here we go. Okay. Races, monstrous adventurers. Got it. Okay, I just clicked the wrong link. Okay, so let me look at goblins. Here we go. So let's see. It looks to me like the goblins are the same. So left on the left we have the. Here, I'm gonna close this. On the left we have our um, Ravnica goblins, uh, and on the right we have the uh, the um, the Valos goblins. Okay. So reach adulthood at eight. Live up to sixty years. The most cautious rarely live longer than 60. Uh, they're chaotic with no inclination towards good or evil, but in D&D, they're typically neutral evil. So that's different. Base walking speed of 30. Dark vision of 60 feet. Fury of the small. Okay, so they look, they look, they're the same mechanically. So these are the same goblins that appeared in Volos uh, mechanically. So they get, if they attack a creature with an attack or a spell and they're bigger than you, you deal extra damage equal to your level. Uh, once you use it, you have to do a short rest. You can take the disengage or hide action as a bonus action on your turn. And then, yeah, the languages are different because they talk about what it's like in Ravnica. In Ravnica, Goblin is a simplistic language with a limited vocabulary and fluid rules of grammar unsuited for any sophisticated conversation. Okay. All right. Yeah, Volo's been to Ravnica. Confirmed. Mordenkainen is a planeswalker. All right, so that's goblins. Look like they would be good uh, good rogues. We've all kind of talked about... We, we've talked about them already, right? Like, we know... Any anybody that's done the kind of the deep dive on goblins has done it in the uh, in the Volos version uh, of goblins, so they're the same. Um, let's see, let's see what we got next. I think next up are the Loxodon. Yeah, I know that card. These guys are all getting plus one plus one right now. Yeah, boys. So the Simic uh, or the Silesian uh, conclave. It looks like they're they're mainly the Loxodon dudes. Um, they are oases of calm in the busy streets of Ravnica. They hum or chant in sonorous tones and move slowly or sit in perfect stillness. If provoked to action, Loxodons are true terrors, bellowing with rage, trumpeting, and flapping their ears. Their serene wisdom, fierce loyalty, and unwavering conviction are tremendous assets to their guild. So they're like seven feet tall, gentle giants. They got a trunk. 
Uh, they are talented artisans uh, culturally. They're in encouraged to, to artisan. Um, they build the Silesian cathedrals. Um, they are relentlessly loyal. Some of them are Orzov or Azorius. Ooh, an Orzov uh, Loxodon would be cool. Ha! <laughs> Bacon up. Is a Loxodon priest called a Hierophant? Boo! But also, good work. <laughs> Uh, cool. All right. So Loxodon, uh, have, um, titles, uh, that come from their community roles, their status and their family connection, hierarch, revered grandmother, healer, saint when interacting with other races. Okay. Um, Tamuj, Bruj, Chedmov, Andros, Danku, Eljuja, Fanur, Vesmova. So yeah, they, they have kind of Ravnican sounding names. Kind of like lots of O's, right? Jasu, Vasul, Golomov, Chedomov, Bruj. Kind of this like, if you can say it in a deep voice like this, it's probably a good Loxodon voice. I like it. Yeah, Slavic elephants. I mean, the whole setting is kind of Slavic, right? We talked about that. Uh, all right. St yeah, Floon. Floon is a great Loxodon name. <laughs> Floon, Bluge. Yep. So the Loxodon uh, get a plus two con, uh, plus one wisdom. I kind of like, I don't know. My inner my inner min maxer hates when you get a plus two as con as your base stat. Kind of hate it. Like the 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 person in me that wants to win Dungeons and Dragons is like, oh man, plus two con. But like, you know, I guess. And then a wisdom of plus one. Um, so like monks, monks and um, monks and barbarians. Um, they physically mature at the same rate as humans. They live to be 450 years. They are usually lawful. Yeah, plus two con is never bad, but it's not necessarily like, it's not like dex. Uh, it doesn't, it's not as clear and obvious. Um, yeah, it's not bad, but it's not perfect. It's not like top tier, one of the top tier stats, but it's a good tanky. Yeah, not a sexy stat, but a good one. Um, yeah, good and boring. Uh, they are medium. They're, they're definitely the top end of medium. How big is a Furbolg? How big is a Furbolg? Let me see if this link. Yeah. Oh, same height. Little less weight. Seven and eight feet tall. Medium size. Yeah. So they're as tall as a Furbolg. Furbolg are taller than I think I, I think of them as. Um, same thing. They have powerful build. So they, same as the Furbolg, 30 feet speed. Uh, they have a advantage on saving throws against charm and frighten. That's useful. Yeah. They're great tanks, right? Charming and frightening are the things that fuck with barbarians. Usually that's, that's actually, that's actually really strong because if you go barbarian, you often have to dump stat, uh, other stuff. But, um, yeah, natural save, uh, natural save, uh, advantage on charm and frighten is really helpful. That's very cool. And then they have, uh, they have natural armor. So when you aren't wearing armor, your AC is 12 plus your con mod. You can use natural armor to determine your AC. If the armor you wear would leave you with lower armor class shields benefit applies normally. Um, now how does a monk, how does a monk calculate their, their armor class? Because I don't think they don't stack these two things. That's the same, right? 10 plus dex plus wisdom. Yeah, they don't, they, there's no stacking. So it's, yeah. So all you have to really do is, yeah, max out your, max out your con. And then I guess if you have a shield, you go with whichever's higher. Yep. So, I mean, like a, like a turtle, like a turtle, you, you get this like bonus. It'd be helpful if you're a Loxodon wizard. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't have a good secondary stat, like if you don't want to dump stuff into your, your decks, but yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and then, uh, your, uh, you have a trunk. You can use it as a snorkel. It's got a reach of five feet. You can lift the number of pounds equal to five times your strength. You can lift, drop, hold, push, pull an object or creature. Hold. You can hold a torch in your trunk while you have a shield and a sword. Isn't that awesome? 
<laughs> you can make an unarmed strike. You can whack people with it. It fits. It fixes that problem where you're like, I need an item. What do I, I got, I, I have two hands. I have to keep dropping my sword and pulling out another thing. You can not attack with, but you could hold another weapon in your fucking trunk and then trade them off. <laughs> I mean, you'd hold the torch up, right? Your trunk is up above for everyone. Now you got three hands. That's right, trunk hype. Um, so you can hold, but not like equip like a shield. Um, yeah, it's got a reach of five feet. You slap people around with your trunk. Um, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So your trunk can't wield weapons or shields. You could hold it, but not wield it. And do anything that requires manual precision, like using tools or magic items or performing the somatic components of a spell. You also have a sensitive trunk, so you have advantage on wisdom, perception, wisdom, survival, and intelligence investigation checks that involve smell. Oh my god, I want to play a Boros detective, like a Wojek detective, who is a Loxodon, who carries in his trunk a magnifying glass. <laughs> Something smells fishy in here. <laughs> <laughs> yep 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 sherlock holmes yeah with a little deer stalker hat but he's a loxodon <laughs> awesome uh that's great i'm into it <laughs> cool all right so that's loxodon um yeah fear of mice exactly uh now other big boys uh here's a minotaur this is the um, the smelter guy, right? Uh, angry Minotaur. Strong in body, dedication, and courage. At home on the battlefield, willing to fight for their various causes. Minotaur have been around in magic since forever, right? Herloon Minotaurs. They've been around for a very long time. Uh, they have hooves. They have horns. They fit in best in the Gruul clans. Uh, but also, many of them are in the Boros Legion. Um, Minotaur Paladins, Minotaur Fighters, Lawful Neutral Types. Um, pretty cool. They're broken down into clans. So like the Karan line, who are in the Gruul clans. The Drenda line. The Tazgral line. Um, and, uh, and they have these like families. Uh, and same thing, like their names are, are yeah, Brogmir, Melzlek, Klatik, Zoka. Yeah. So they're, um... They're, they're, they also have like Slavic names, kind of reinforcing that that setting stuff. Um, so the Minotaur character has the following racial traits. They're suitable for Minotaurs in other worlds where these people have avoided the demonic influence of Baphomet, right? Baphomet is like why Minotaurs are bad in in D and D, but in this they're not. They get a plus two strength. They get plus one con. Um, they're lawful or chaotic, depending on if they're in Boros, Rakdos, or Gruul. Um, they're over six feet tall, stocky builds, medium with a 30 foot speed. Their horns are natural melee weapons. They can make unarmed strikes that deal piercing damage equal to 1d6 plus your strength mod. They can do a goring rush. Uh, so immediately after you use the dash action, uh, you can make a melee attack with your horns as a bonus action. And then, immediately after you hit a creature with a melee attack, as part of the attack action, you get a bonus attack to shove them with your horns. This is actually really cool. I really like the shove. So, the target must be no more than one size larger than you within five feet. Unless it succeeds on a strength save, uh, they get pushed ten feet. That's huge. Normal shoving sucks in D&D. But hammering horns is pretty fucking... Like, being able to throw someone ten feet is a pretty big deal. Um, normally it's quite hard to reposition people. Um, and no, I don't, a, a shove is not an attack of opportunity. Um, forced movement doesn't, uh, doesn't encourage it. Um, it has to be part of the attack action. Um, and you use your bonus action to do it. So you can't gore and shove, but a 10 foot shove is a pretty big deal. And yeah, if you go polearm master that right bacon. Bacon up's on point today. Bacon up, if you go Polar Master, charge them, shove them away, and then when they try to get to you, just poke them with your polearm, poke them with your spear. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, and then you get proficiency by default in uh, either intimidation or persuasion, right? So you're you're a big deal. 
Um, it doesn't look like shoving someone into a wall does any damage. I know some abilities say, like, if you have any farther to go, like, it, you get shoved 20 feet, and if you stop at 10, you get 1d6 for every one that you get shoved. I, it's not built into the rule. Um, so, so it doesn't, you get like nudged, uh, it's, it's less like smashing into the wall. Yeah. Um, but there are abilities for that. So yeah, like I could see like a crowd control paladin, right? Sentinel, um, that kind of thing. I could definitely see that being, being possible, uh, for the, uh, for, for a minotaur, kind of a fun build there. Yeah, I dig it. Uh, cool. All right. And you read, speak and write common and minotaur. Yeah. You stumble back, right? Not getting like stabbed and thrown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is this is where stuff starts getting weird. Now, the Simic haven't... I'm not super familiar with the Simic Combine because they haven't gotten many cards, right? They don't have cards in the main set, and I haven't gone back and looked at stuff. But this is how you be a weird mutant. If you want to be a weird Simic Combine bio mutant, here you go. So this looks like an elf that's being made into a crab mutant with your, your crab shoulders. Um, so if we take a look, yeah, they're magic to extend, a uh, fuse different life forms together. Humans, elves, Vidalcan, the Guardian Project is to build a simic army of soldiers adapted to a variety of combat situations. Hyper-evolved specimens are called simic hybrids, though they sometimes refer to themselves as guardians. So, uh, they're the product of simic magic. They include... Crab claws, squid tentacles, wings or fins like a manta ray, translucent or camouflage skin, or shark-like maws filled with sharp teeth. Damn. So, uh, Cybric Hybrid tend to have names uh, adopted from their, their parental uh, race, but they can make up their own after they transform. Uh, they get con plus two to represent that they have to survive, right? And then they get one more uh, for any stat. They begin their lives as humans, elves, or Vidalcan. Um, we don't know how long they lived because the Guardian Project hasn't been around. Um, their alignment is generally neutral, but, you know, they could have left the Combine. So you could be, like, an escaped... Uh, awesome. Like, you could play an escaped Simic who went and joined a different uh, different guild, right? Like, the Simic made you into this hybrid, and then they, they experimented on you, and you fled, and you joined, like, the Silesian uh, Conclave. I like that idea. That's cool. Um, you were kidnapped by the Demir and they, they like adopted you as one of their own. So they get a bunch of base humanoid stuff, right? Walking speed of 30 size, medium. They get dark vision because everybody in D and D, I guess, gets dark vision now <laughs> just for kicks. They get uh, common and either Elvish or Vidalcan. And now they get one animal enhancement, one animal enhancement now at first level and one more at fifth level. So you can mix and match. Would you like to have Manta glide? So fins that uses wings to slow your fall, uh, subtracting 100 feet from the fall and move up to two feet horizontally for every foot you descend. So you can become a cool manta glider. <laughs> um, you get a nimble spe climbing speed. So climbing speed equal to your walking speed. You can have underwater adaptation. And then at fifth level, you can either adapt another first level one. So you could have manta fins and underwater adaptation, or you can pick a fifth level one, such as grappling appendages. Choose whether they're both claws or tentacles. You can use use them to grab people. <laughs> um, you can get a carapace, which gives you a plus one bonus to AC whenever you're not wearing heavy armor. Or you can get acid spit. So you could be an acid spitting manta man, or you could be a nimble climbing tentacle grappler. So there you go. Simic Combine. Be one of these weird dudes. <laughs> cool. So there you go. So you can be a you can be a weird mutant. Yeah, nice for monk. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, there's some cool because obviously like you choose your your race and then you sort of figure out what's a cool class for them. Uh all right. So now the Vidalcan. Uh, so the Vidalcan are the last of the new the new races for this this book for Guildmaster's Guide, and they are uh, cool and rational, uh, reasoning towards perfection. Uh, they rejoice in the fact that nothing is perfect and uh, seek to improve uh, and to uh, to to progress. This leads Vidalcan to pursue their work with delighted enthusiasm, never deterred by setbacks. Uh, they are experimenters, right? Blue Vulcans, yeah, kinda, right? Tall. Lanky, 
Let's uh, let's see. Curious intellect and rational minds incline them towards the Azorius Senate, the Simic Combine, and sometimes the Izzet League. They put their intelligence to use in crafting and improving things. Given names at birth, but if, but usually choose new names as part of their tra tradition into adulthood. Rarely use family names. Let's look at their stats. Intelligence two, wisdom one. Okay, makes sense. Uh, slow, slow maturity. They're not mature till 40. Same. Usually lawful and non-evil. Six to six feet tall, less than 200 pounds. 30 foot speed. Advantage on... Jesus Christ! What? Holy shit! They just flat out get advantage on every intelligence, wisdom, and charisma save. That's it. Just cool yeah their stats aren't great but like that is it's gnome resilience but like better that's that's pretty cool all advantage uh advantage on all intelligence wisdom and charisma saves dope that's very cool uh and then you get one skill of your choice arcana history investigation medicine performance or sleight of hand you're also proficient in one tool Whenever you make an ability check with a chosen skill or tool, you get guidance on it. That's cool. Like internal guidance. And then you're partly amphibious, so you can breathe underwater for an hour. Right? You can't use this trait again until you get a long rest. Neat. So they're like kind of amphibious humans. That saving throw thing is badass. Yeah, there's stats like... I mean, a uh, Vidalkin wizard would be kind of would be kind of cool, um, but this is this is that's hefty. I mean, there's not a ton of like intelligence saves, but wisdom and charisma. There's some strong spells that that fuck with that. Yeah, they're not perfect, but uh, they're they're definitely they're definitely cool. They're they're aimed at a very specific thing. Um, cool. All right. So those are your those are your options for uh, for races in the uh, in the Guildmaster's Guide. And I think maybe we've reached the end of the chapter. Yeah, let's go. Let's go back. Oops. Nope. Let's go back to the races here. Oh, no, that's just giving me the races for all the things. Okay, let's go back to my uh, table of contents. Ravnica. Pretty cool, though. And I bet you, I bet you by now you're like, I'm excited to see this thing. Yeah, we're going to, we'll look at the subclasses. That's next. Um, Just hitting the next button didn't take me to the next page. So I'm finding I'm finding the other way to get at it. I gotta keep my table of contents open here. Um, okay, so classes by guild and subclass options. So let's look at uh, classes by guild. All right. What's up, Golgari? Yes. So good. Yes. Fuck, I love the Golgari. They're so cool. Look at all these, look at all these Silesian losers. Maybe they're Boros losers. They're all dead now anyway.